Good afternoon and welcome to our cardiac and vascular lecture series. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the chat box on your screen. Please post your questions directly to the moderator. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Constantino Peña. His presentation will be pulmonary embolism and prostate embolization, latest treatments at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Dr. Peña is an interventional radiologist and the medical director of vascular imaging at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, which is part of Baptist Health South Florida. Dr. Peña earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Stanford University and his medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut. He completed his residency in diagnostic radiology and vascular interventional fellowship in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Peña is a clinical assistant professor of radiology at Florida International University College of Medicine and an affiliate associate professor of radiology at the University of South Florida College of Medicine in Tampa, Florida. He has served on several committees for many professional organizations. He is currently serving on the radiology information committee of the American College of Radiology and Radiological Society of North America and the Society of Interventional Radiology. He serves as the chair for the Cardiovascular Radiology and Interventional Council of the America's Heart, Heart Association. Dr. Peña is a fellow of the Society of Interventional Radiology, American Heart Association, and the Society of Cardiovascular Cardiothoracic Surgery. He is also a member of the Radiological Society of North America, American College of Radiology. Please let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Constantino Peña. Thank you so much, Dr. Peña, for accepting our invitation. Great, hello. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'd like to first welcome everyone. It's a really a pleasure and honor to speak to everyone. And uh, I know it's uh, via Zoom, but uh, I'd like to, again, uh, welcome everybody. Um, buenos días, lo que hablo en español. Vamos a hablar en inglés, pero si tienen alguna pregunta en español, sin pena me la pueden hacer después. Um, we're going to speak today about the latest treatment at MCVI, and I chose two of many uh, treatments just to give you a, a feel of what's going on at MCVI. These are just some disclosures, really nothing relevant. First of all, on behalf of everyone at MCVI, uh, we hope everyone is safe. We know that some people have uh, just on and experience a hurricane and uh, other people, all of us can, you know, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of different things going on in 2020. We hope everyone again, continues safe and wish everyone the best. I'm gonna give you a little feel of what happened in Miami and how things are going. This is a COVID-19 Miami-Dade, so the hospitals in Miami-Dade admissions uh, from March to last week. And you get an idea of what we went through. We had a very, small, you know, what we thought was a surge in March and, and April into May in the summer. But then really in June, we had our, our what we hope will be our major surge where we had, uh, this is for whole Miami Dade at Baptist Hospital, we had about 300 patients in the hospital at that time. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about where we are now. I think we've learned a lot. I think the hospital is safe for patients, as well as uh, staff and physicians. A lot of different measures that have been taken. One of them is universal mask use. Uh, we have visitor precautions, and, and these are updated pretty much weekly, as well as point of entry screening, which means everyone who walks in the hospital is through certain point of entries and, and they're screened. We have limitations as to the number of visitors that we have. And again, you have to wear the um, mask that, that is given. Giving you some idea of physical changes that happened. You can see on some of the entrance ways, you can see here, um, we, you know, we had some information about what was going on in the hospital, how many admissions, how many people had gone home safely after recovering from COVID that day. And we saw that people were getting their temperature checked. Now we actually have these digital uh, thermal uh, checks where you can check your, without having to touch anything and you can tell you if your temperature is okay. We have people being protected with plexiglass, so again, protects not only the staff, but also the patient that comes. And we have different things to remind us how many people should be on the elevator and to keep our distance. 
But even through COVID, I want to, I like to note that innovation is still working strong and is, is a really essential to the Miami Cardiac and uh, Vascular Institute and to Baptist Health South Florida. As you see with innovation, we want to continue uh, to kindle that spirit of what's new in medicine and continue to make sure we are still pushing forward. And as I started thinking about what to speak about today, there's so many things that came to my mind. You know, we have Dr. McGinn now who's the head of uh, cardiac surgery, and he's doing a lot in terms of minimally invasive cardiac surgery. We have a lot of structural heart innovations. So our structural heart team just this year did the first left ventricular, percutaneous left ventricular aneurysm repair. So through the skin, being able to close a left ventricular aneurysm uh, with a device called the bioventrix. Also, the first mitral valve actual replacement of the valve. Again, percutaneous replacement using a tendine device. These are, again, first for Baptist Health and, and for South Florida. In the vascular interventional innovations, we saw the first, and we were participated in a percutaneous SFA bypass trial, so creating our own uh, femoral to popliteal artery bypass in the leg percutaneous without needing open surgery. We've done a lot of work in terms of shockwave angioplasty, so now dilating vessels that may be calcified using uh, lithotripsy type devices to get a better result. We've seen a lot of work being done on trans uh, carotid stenting. And then also technology innovations. We uh, opened up last year the first uh, MR that doesn't need um, a significant amount of, uh, of helium. In other words, there's an MRI machine that just uses six liters of helium and is sealed. Uh, we've had the first uh, flex arm room that was again uh, started with a new technology. It was started here at MCVI and that's been starting now for about two years. And this week, we're just opened our new EP lab, also using brand new technology innovation. So a lot of innovations that continue to happen at MCI, considering everything that's going on with COVID. So really what I'd like to do today is speak for hopefully a few minutes on two different topics. Uh, one of them is going to be pulmonary embolism. And the second topic will be discussing about prostate artery embolization, which I think are two technologies that are mature. They're new technologies, but very mature, but that we're still doing a lot of work on. So pulmonary embolism really is this event where there is clot that can go into the pulmonary artery. So most of the time the clot starts in the leg, but we see that this clot will go up through the cava and get, uh, go through the uh, left, uh, right side of the heart and basically go into the pulmonary arteries and cause these pulmonary embolism. Um, this, is, this is a picture from a New England Journal Review article from 2008. And a lot of times, you know, pulmonary embolism, why, why do we care about it? Well, it's really the, probably the number one cause of death in hospitalized patients. We think about half of all pulmonary embolisms are caused in hospitalized patients, where those are inpatients or in nursing home patients. Um, we know that it's a significant number of cases, at least in the United States, which I know it's worldwide because it's a worldwide problem. And once someone has a pulmonary embolism, they have a chance of dying from the pulmonary embolism. And we know that one third of those patients will have another pulmonary embolism within 10 years. So it was the no surprise in 2008 when the Surgeon General of the United States said, hey, this is a really important problem. We need to understand DVT and pulmonary embolism. And I think what we're seeing now really comes out from all that effort that we see uh, from the Surgeon General, from this awareness of, uh, of this type of venous embolism disease. So can, how do we know these patients have pulmonary embolism? Can we treat them? You know, what do we do with them? And I think there's some really important questions. If we have a patient with a pulmonary embolism, will they get worse? And do we know if they're going to get worse? Which patients have the highest mortality? And you know, if it causes so much death, which ones are the ones that can cause death? And there's something that we can do to prevent that kind of death. So a couple of studies were done, and they looked at patients. They retrospectively looked at patients that had uh, a pulmonary embolism. And now with CT pulmonary studies, we can pick up a lot of these. Some of these we pick up incidentally. And the question is, if you see something, how do we know what causes death in those patients? So they went back over 1,500 patients, and they saw patients that have a history of malignancy, coronary artery disease, and older patients have high, high, high mortality. And you can see here another study that looked at what about the clot? Does the amount of thrombus, is, is that important? And they looked at different ways to look at the thrombus, and what they found was the amount of thrombus really wasn't that important. But what they found was that if the thrombus, however, causes obstruction, enough obstruction, that your right heart has to work harder, those are the patients that can start having a mortality. So really, this is where the connection with, between 
pulmonary embolism and right heart strain or a work on the right heart that would affect uh, mortality. And this started to get published again, 2010, 2012, we started seeing these studies. Again, the timing is very interesting after the Surgeon General said that. And this is a conclusion of this paper that was written in probably the number one most important radiology journal looking at right heart dilatation and uh, mortality. So what are the prognostic uh, indicators? You see, well, if you start having right heart failure, that causes early death. And they said, well, you know, you can maybe see right heart failure on, on CT scan. If you see that the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle on a CT scan, then maybe you can say, hey, this increases mortality. And they saw, hey, this increased at three times compared to patients that had normal um, uh, dilatations in their CT scans. So now we have the ability to say, wow, I can get a CT scan, I can, uh, I can diagnose the problem, but I can also have an idea, is this going to be a severe problem for that patient? And this is really what's changed our management of this disease, which is very significant and has significant mortality and morbidity. And this is another study that looked at patients with ventricular dilatation and looked at 400, over 400 patients, and they looked at a 30-day mortality of 15%. And they compared uh, which ones had the dilated ventricle to those that didn't. And you can see that those that had the dilated ventricle had much less survival, very significant survival at day 10 and day 20. So really short-term demonstrating the hazard. You can imagine after this, a lot of different studies have been performed. This is a meta-analysis, again, showing that if you have right heart strain, this causes mortality. So now, if I have a patient and the patient has a pulmonary embolism, what do I do? How do I treat this patient? How does this help me treat my patient? Before we get into that, I think we should talk a little bit about terms because you're going to hear a lot of terms. And I think it's important to understand when we talk about pulmonary embolism, we might talk about a massive pulmonary embolism or a submassive, or some people call them intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. And most of the pulmonary embolisms that we see are going to be minor. These are patients that can have a sub amount of clot, but they're not going to really have any secondary effects. Those effects may not be that there's no effects on the right ventricle or that they don't have any real biomarkers that show that they have any strain on the right heart. And then you're going to have a very small percentage, less than 5%, that are going to present and they're acutely sick. These people are to the other end of the spectrum. You can imagine these patients have a 58% mortality. All right, so these are very few. These are the patients that we normally see and say, well, that patient's going to die of a pulmonary embolism. What we're trying to do is can we identify these submassive group and can we treat them so that we prevent them from showing this mortality of you know, 2 to 3% or 21% at three months, depending on the study we look at. So we get into the terms. How do we get these terms? Massive pulmonary embolism has nothing to do with the amount of clot someone has in a pulmonary artery. So whether you have a lot of pulmon uh, embolism or a little pulmonary embolism, that does not really, we don't use that as a quantification. So try to, if you're going to do one thing and learn one thing about this talk, is once someone has a pulmonary embolism, your next question is, what's the effect of that pulmonary embolism, as opposed to how much clot is there? That's really what you want to figure out. So we talk about massive pulmonary embolism. These are patients that had hypotension. So they presented and they're hypotensive. They may have bradycardia. Okay, these are patients that, that fall into that less than 5%, extremely ill. These patients we need to treat right away. Okay, right away, we'll talk about treatment. Now you're talking about that intermediate high risk or that submassive PE. These are patients that come in, they're not hypotensive, but they have some changes to that right heart. That right heart is working overtime, whether it's on the CT where we see that dilatation, where we start seeing some elevations in pro BMP, we may see some troponin leak, all related to the right ventricular failure. You may also take a look at an echo and see if there's right heart you know, you know, failure on that echo. So there's a lot of biomarkers that we use to try to diagnose submassive pulmonary embolism. And these are the people that now we're trying to treat. These are the people that you know, may look good, but may fall off the cliff in a day or a few, few hours if we don't treat them. These are the ones that have that mortality somewhere between two to 20% within the first 30 days. So let's talk a little bit about treatment. I think it's important if you have someone with a pulmonary embolism, your first step should be to anticoagulate that patient, okay? And we know that we probably aren't as aggressive as we should be, and we should be aggressive with this. And there's a lot of different regimens. You can do oral agents, you can do IV agents, however you feel comfortable and your practice feels comfortable in terms of treating those patients. But again, remember what I told you, you wanna pick up that sub-massive group or that intermediate high risk group that shows some right ventricular dysfunction. Because as this graph show, the difference between being 
hanging in there and having a mortality, a very low mortality rate of one to 2% to having a 30% mortality rate shock and death is a very quick change. And can we identify that change of that right heart failure? So there's a lot of different algorithms that's come out, again, trying to evaluate, can we, can we risk stratify these patients? And again, these are the patients we're trying to look at, intermediate high risk or what we call submassive group that we're trying to rest, prevent from going into that high mortality risk. Here you see a PERT and pulmonary uh, embolism response team. That's what PERT stands for. At Baptist Health, we have a PERT team. And basically it's made of CT surgeons, interventional radiologists, interventional cardiologists, all working together, pulmonary physicians, to try to identify these patients. And then we meet and say, okay, what do we need to do? And I'd say, we're going to get an echo. Then I can speak to the interventional cardiologist. We can talk about what did you think about the echo? Is your right heart strain? So all these things are now done as a team approach to figure out what's the best for that patient that's presented. So what are the treatment options and why am I as an interventional, uh, interventional radiologist talking so much about pulmonary embolism? And that's because I think now that there's a lot of different techniques that we have to treat these patients. I talked a little bit about anticoagulation and these is really your first line. But when I see someone that has, whether it's massive pulmonary embolism that I'm gonna start with IV TPA, or if there's a patient that's submassive pulmonary embolism, I'm gonna consider if that person is high enough risk to try to break up that clot. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. I can still give that patient systemic uh, thrombolytics with TPA. I may try to place a catheter, and there's two really types of catheters. I can use a catheter to instill medication or TPA over 12 to 24 hours in the pulmonary artery, or I can go into the pulmonary artery and actually aspirate or suck out the thrombus. And there's a lot of different things that have been done. This is a study that was published in 2014, again, talked about treating patients with thrombolysis compared to anticoagulation. They found that patients that received thrombolysis did a lot better. Unfortunately, these patients also have a high bleeding risk. That's why we don't do this on every patient. We, use, we really use systemic or TPA, 100 milligrams IV. Some people use a half dose, really on patients that are having a massive pulmonary embolism. We need to act right away. That's why we get it, because we know there's a higher risk of bleeding in those patients. Surgical embolectomy, again, there's a higher mortality rate with surgical embolectomy, particularly in the acute setting, but it's important to have this available. And we just did a patient last week that we treated with surgical embolectomy. So this is important. Catheter-directed therapies, and this is what we are involved with. In the old days, before we had all these fancy catheters and techniques, we would go in there with a catheter and try to break up the clot. Or we had these small little aspiration catheters, and I would aspirate with a syringe. Very little suction not really getting a big, a lot done. I really was trying to break up the thrombus to get better, um, to get better blood flow to the, to the lung. When uh, the first study started coming out in the early 2010s to 11s, we looked at these devices that had ultrasound to assist me, and they would put the catheters in the pulmonary artery that had some ultrasound to help get the, the TPA into the clot and break it up. And these were the first studies that were done, very well, stu well done studies that showed the pressures, looking at pressures in the pulmonary arteries and looking at CT scans before and after instilling the pulmonary arteries with TPA for 12 or 24 hours. And they saw significant changes in the pulmonary artery pressures as well in the CTA findings. Then we have devices that would come in and take to that. This is the flare study, a device that looked like a clot retriever. These are devices that have these little baskets, very soft baskets. You would open the baskets in the pulmonary artery and really take out the clot and aspirate it. Um, and, and again, looking at the difference in the, uh, in the CT findings of these patients. We were involved in the extract PE trial. This is a trial that uses devices that would aspirate clots. So think of them as, as really uh, fine, almost suction catheters. You would hook them up to a very strong at, uh, suction with six or 12 atmospheres of suction. You'd be able to aspirate the clot and almost like a vacuum, aspirate the clot and get the patient better very quickly. And we were part of this study that was done in 22 centers, 119 patients. We were one of the lead enrollers in this study that used an eight French catheter and it showed improvement and not needing to do anything else in 98.3% of the patients really only took about 37 minutes and the patients were hardly ever in the ICU, very small time as we watched them in the ICU. And this is just an example of one of those patients. You can see here in the right pulmonary artery. So this is over the chest. This is the pulmonary artery. You see a catheter that I have here. I don't know if you can see my marker. And then you can see that there's a catheter. That's the aspiration catheter. And I'm having this little wire device 
that I'm using to pull the clot in and out and aspirating the clot and trying to break up the thrombus. I don't really expect you to take a lot from that, but I expect you to see a lot from here. So you can see here on the right, this is beforehand, and you can see all these areas in the pulmonary artery were all clot. And you can see that there was good blood flow here, but not great blood flow to the lower part of the lung. After we put that catheter in and aspirated, this is what we got, a lot better aspiration and cleaning of that, of that lung, much better perfusion. And this occurs instantaneously. And we can measure pressures and we saw changes in pressures. We then do CT scans and echoes and showed improvement. And this is just an example of that same exact case that I just talked to you about how we can get all this clot out. There's new technology now that uses this device that actually has a computer chip in it. So I don't necessarily have to lose a lot of blood as I'm aspirating. And it's smart enough to tell me that, I'm, that, I, that if it's free blood, it turns itself off and turns it on. It makes it, it's now like a smart vacuum cleaner really makes it easy for us to really clean up those pulmonary arteries and take out the clot. So in terms of my little talk on pulmonary embolism, I think that this is difficult to diagnose sometimes. You have to have that clinical uh, thought, hey, this patient may have a pulmonary embolism, but a CTA is a great way to diagnose it. When you diagnose it, it just may be a normal pulmonary embolism, you're going to anticoagulate that patient. But I think it's important to assess, do you think that patient is having some type of heart right heart strain, or is that right heart working harder than it should be because of the pulmonary embolism? In those cases, then some kind of treatment may be helpful. That may be with a catheter, that may be with catheter-directed lysis, that may be, again, with TPA. These are all things that we can, we can assess. So now we're really going to change, right? Where I just gave you like a 12-minute world tour of pulmonary embolism and all these things that I know you're going to see. And I'm about to switch completely different to prostate embolization. And this is why I love being an interventional radiologist. And I love being an interventional radiologist because I treat all body parts, all around, you know, basically all types of patients. I get to interact with all the doctors in the hospital and all the patients, just because we do so many different things. And really as an interventional radiologist, we're known a lot of times as the doctors that will stop bleeding right? Someone's having bleeding in their GI tract, they call us, hey, maybe you can embolize. And embolization really was, hey, finding an artery and blocking it. And sometimes we can block it permanently. Sometimes we can block it uh, temporarily. There's so many different things that we can do to block arteries. And a lot of times we open arteries. So all this vascular stuff has led us to look at a lot of different treatments. And I can tell you 20 years ago, we figured out that we were able to treat uterine fibroids with embolization. And that's one of the huge areas for interventional radiologists doing an outpatient procedure to treat patients with fibroids. About 12 years ago, work started being done on prostate. And can we affect prostate hypertrophy by embolizing the prostate? And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about. Can we embolize or devascularize the prostate gland? In other words, treating the arteries that go to the prostate and cause the prostate to shrink. And by shrinking, what kind of advantages can we get? Just showing you here of the, of the picture of the prostate. And the prostate has this glandular tissue with, again, the urethra going through it. And a lot of times, men will have symptoms from this because it constricts the urethra. And these symptoms can be very devastating. And just to give you some idea, here's an example of an MRI before the treatment. You can see a prostate gland, which is on the big side, about 75 grams. Usually a prostate is about 30 grams is what we try to say of the average size. And then after 30 days of embolization, you see how small the prostate is, already reduced 40%. So when we're talking about benign prostatic hypertrophy or BPH, this is a very common condition. It starts really affecting men over the age of 50. And we think that about 70% of men over 70 will have some type of symptoms, right? They may not be severe symptoms, but some type of symptoms. And a lot of these we'll talk about urinary frequency, urgency, and a lot of other symptoms. And we classify these as LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms. And these symptoms can be very significant because they can affect someone's quality of life. Usual treatments can include alpha blockers. So we have dosoxin, tamsolazine, terazosin. These are all medications that will relax the smooth muscle tone of the bladder neck and help release some of this obstruction. And patients may take this. Other patients may be on 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride is a, a very popular one. This can help shrink the gland, effective in about 20% of the patients. Other patients take tadafinil um, and, and, and Cialis, and that could also help with BPH. 
And we know that there's surgical options, particularly in patients with a, with a prostate under a 100 grams. These patients can be treated with transurethral resection and kind of cleaning out uh, that area, particularly around the urethra. So what's the concept of prostate artery embolization? Well, basically, can we get small particles into the arteries that go to the prostate to close those arteries out? And by closing those arteries and blocking those arteries, can we get that prostate to become ischemic, necrotic, and to shrink? And how long will that take? And is that effective at reducing the gland of the, of the size of the gland? And more importantly, really improving symptoms, these LUTs that we talked about. There's a couple of things that are important. That is the blood supply of the prostate gland can be very variable, can affect uh, several different arteries it can come from. And there are a lot of arteries nearby that can go to the bowel, to the penis, to the bladder, and all these things we need to make sure that we're not embolizing. So technically it's a little bit tricky. But really when I see a patient, I'm looking for patients that have LUTs, symptoms related to this, so frequency, urgency, nocturia, urge incontinence, weak stream, all these are things that I'm looking at. And at the same time, I wanna make sure they're not having irritative symptoms. So they're not having a hyperactive bladder. They don't have a prostate cancer or cancer or prostate infection, because I, these are not things that I'm gonna get better. So evaluation most of the time with a urologist is really essential for me. And we work together with urology on these patients. Then we score the patient. We look to see what their symptom scores are. And this is really important because this gives me an idea. Everyone comes to see me and they're all having all these symptoms. And it, to me, it's like they're having a terrible life. Like this is the worst. But when I have them really think about how bad their symptoms are, I can quantitate and get a number and have an idea. Are they mild, moderate, or severe? And I can then compare them. And more importantly, when the patient comes back to see me in a month, I can compare how they're doing. So we use these type of scoring symptoms. I think it's very important as well as a quality of life assessment. So who's a good candidate for this procedure? Really what I look for are patients that can't undergo surgery or don't want to have surgery. I look for patients with hematuria or bleeding issues. This is really how we started doing this procedure 15 years ago. We start with what I consider patients that really don't have a lot of other options. We treat them with a hematuria and at the same time, we treat their BPH or their enlarged glands. I will treat glands that are so large that the urologist can't treat. They don't want to do a TERP or they can't do a TERP because the gland is so big. And again, being helped these patients. Another area is patients with indwelling catheters. They can't live without that Foley. Can we shrink the prostate and hopefully get the catheter out? And we've been very successful with that. Again, when we're treating the prostate gland, we're looking at the capsular branches with the peripheral zone, but also down in the, in the more transitional zone in the middle so that we can get effects upon the urethra and effects on, on the stream and these symptoms. These are just, I know, very kind of detailed picture, but just give you an idea what we're looking at when we do these procedures. We put a catheter in the artery of the internal um, iliac or the hypogastric artery and start looking to see where do we find these arteries. Our machinery will have a CT scan capability. So we're able to do CT type imaging in the room so we can confirm that our arteries is, that, that we're selecting are the right ones. So it really increases the safety of these procedures. And then we go ahead and treat the patients with embolization. Procedure can take a few hours, but afterwards we see patients having good satisfaction, having very good improvement, and uh, a really a durable result. In terms of evidence, you know, these are all trials that have been done you know, going back from 2014. Largest trial in 2014 was in China and other trials that we have. I'd like to just point out this trial. This was recently published at the end of last year, so about a year ago. And basically, it was done as a sham procedure. They took two groups of patients, and the patients had no idea what, what they were going to get. They, were going to, they, put, they, were, they underwent, they went into the procedure room, they actually went in and got a catheterization. They just didn't know if they actually got particles put in or not. So this is really the kind of the essence of really finding out if, if this procedure works or not. And you can see that the patients had a lot of symptoms, and both groups were very similar. But when you look at the results, and I'm just going to look at this group right here at the very top left, the top group is the sham arm. So you can see at one month, both showed some improvement, more on the patients that got the embolization. And after six months, you can see that the patients that got embolization, their symptom score way down, mild to almost minimal symptoms. The sham group stayed up for six months. And then after six months, the patients that were in the sham group could undergo the procedure. So then they undergo the procedure. And then you can see at the sham group after six months, they also had benefit of the procedure. So I think this is really important, doing a sham procedure with a crossover 
showing you that this, that this procedure actually works with good results and that were reproducible. And they also looked at complications. You saw very little complications in both groups. Um, looking at how does it compare to TERP, again, very similar effects to TERP. I think here, when I'm looking at for, you know, surgical uh, procedures, transurethra procedures, I, I, we see that you know, the TERP group may have more adverse effects, but I still think if a patient can undergo this procedure, I go ahead and let them get this procedure. And I really save my procedure for patients that have a patient a preference or they cannot undergo term procedure. After the procedure, usually the patient goes home that same day. They have light activity for two weeks. Um, I have them on some non-steroidals, some medications for their bladder spasms. But most, the most part, patients do very well. They come back and see us in a month and are very happy. Potential side effects, again, some spasms. We give them some medications for that some stool softeners because of the medications during the procedure. And the complications, again, can you get some infection? Uh, we treat them with antibiotics for the first five days. I'll just show you a case of an 81-year-old who's really having a lot of bleeding from the prostate. His hemoglobin had dropped to eight. Uh, he had history of severe aortic stenosis, so couldn't go uh, undergo surgery. We got and uh, did this run looking at the prostatic artery. You can see a very characteristic look and very tortuous vessel. We use what we call microcatheter. So think of, you know, you have spaghetti and then you have really small capellini. I mean, that's really what this is. Really small vessels getting into those arteries, feeding the prostate and then treating them. So I would say PAE is really our 15 years of experience of really coming as the latest area of procedures that we're doing. Uh, it really sh has been benefiting a lot of our patients and something that I think will continue to grow. And I think it's good for you to understand really the different things we do as interventional radiologists here at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. So with that, I think um, uh, on behalf of all my partners here at MCVI, we uh, welcome you uh, anytime to reach out to us. We look forward to, to being involved uh, and helpful, however we can be. And uh, I'll end with this picture. This is um, after the, um, basically after that large surge we had our, these six blue angels fly over Baptist Hospital as a gratitude and thank you for all the stuff that all of us do here. And I, it's, we're all a team. So really appreciate that. And I hope you guys can enjoy that because I know you guys are doing a lot also in your countries. So with that, I'll stop. I don't know if there's any questions, Dr. Hacken, but ready thank to go, you. Akeem. Thank you, Dr. Pena. What a great presentation. And uh, we're in awe uh, in regards to the complexity of uh, these two types of treatments. Uh, but before I continue, I want to say thank you personally to you and to the entire team at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute for the great work you guys have been doing, uh, not only during the pandemic, but obviously during the uh, historical 30 something years that you guys have been working there. So thank you for all you do for our patients. Um, we're going to wait for some questions, but uh, there is an actual question that came about in regards to the uh, to the prostate artery embolization. And it's, uh, in essence, uh, how long do you have to actually wait for a patient to be considered uh, for this type of procedure, being that the patient is already diagnosed with BPH has had some mild symptoms initially, but is not necessarily bleeding. So how does a physician determine, now it's time for us to recommend the, um, the PAE? I think that's a great question, particularly if you're looking at the international model, right? If we look at a patient here, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's funny, when I look at COVID, I think COVID has really changed the way we practice. And I think it's interesting that I think we're going to see a lot more changes occurring. I think what we would see is it may have a patient that say, hey, this may be a good patient. And that patient may get referred by their primary care physician or their physician. They get referred by a urologist. I get a lot of patients from a urologist. And now that patient doesn't necessarily need to see me right away. I will call them and we'll do some kind of teleconference Well, we'll we look at everything. I talk to the patient. I explain the procedure to the patient. I have the, and you know, I may have in some patients, I get an MRI if I need to, if I'm worried about what the prostate gland looks like, the size, could there be tumor, um, you know, all these things that I may want to kind of clarify. But once I've clarified all of these things with the patient, then I can make the decisions that, you know what, I think you'd be a good candidate. And then the patient, uh, we can tell them what, you know, what they have to do ahead of time. They may be taking some antibiotics a day before, but they'll come for the procedure. And, uh, you know, after two or three days, they can go back, back home. 
So uh, I think a lot of the evaluation for a patient can be done ahead of time. And really what I'm looking for are patients that are having symptoms and what options they have for those symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. Some patients will have bleeding, but some patients will just have severe, you know, LUT symptoms, but their prostate may be too big. Maybe they've already had uh, a TERP and it hasn't been successful. They've tried the medication and hasn't been successful. Most patients come after trying a lot of different conservative managements. And then, you know, this is they're, they're trying to avoid uh, a big surgery and they come here. A lot of them may have other risk factors or comorbidities. And, and the good news is that uh, obviously a skilled uh, urologist could also guide the patient and tell him, we're going to start you on this medication as soon as your symptoms get complicated, then an option will be the, uh, the embolization. So uh, that, that is phenomenal. Um, how old is this procedure, doctor? So, I mean, I think the initial work was done about 12 years ago. We've always done it for patients with bleeding. But it really led to a couple of people saying, hey, can this affect other things and can it shrink the prostate? And uh, from then, it's, it's really taken off. I think we've had you know, a lot of work being done in this now. A lot of it has been done in Brazil, a lot of that in Portugal as well. So there, there is, a, you know, it's been around for, for I would say, 10 years. And I think it's come of age probably in the last five years with become more standard. We have a question from one of the participants, and it says, uh, do you use the perfected technique for your prostatic embolization? So a perfected technique was a, uh, one of the techniques that had been created where you can remember how we looked at that picture where you said there's capsular branches and there's more central branches. The perfected technique is just a way that we treat that, that patient. We could give them a little bit of particles from where we have a good position that treats the whole gland. And once we have a good result, we may then advance the catheter a little bit more to try to give a little bit more of that blocking medicine or those particles into the central of part of the gland to try to get a better treatment. So yeah, we try to do the perfected technique when we can. Thank you, Dr. Kusterman, a great friend of ours in Guatemala. We, we're okay. glad to have you. Um, so you also spoke about uh, the um, pulmonary embolization and, and um, a pulmonary embolism rather, and the techniques that uh, we're using at MCDI. Um, I know that uh, in the past uh, two years, you guys have absorbed a great deal of new technologies. Uh, you have gotten to a complete rehaul of uh, the beautiful building. And now we have these incredible operating theaters to, where you and, and the entire team participate in. Uh, what are you most excited about in regards to technology and the use of technology for the treatment of uh, embolizations and uh, embolization as a treatment, and obviously to treat pulmonary uh, issues or conditions. You no, know, I think that what we're seeing is particularly with pulmonary embolism is that this is a very common condition. We see a lot of it, right? And now with CT scanning, you see more than you want to see. But now we're learning to differentiate. Okay, which are the patients that may get sicker? Which are the patients that may actually have a problem. What are the patients that, if we treat now, we can prevent from having pulmonary hypertension and being short of breath six months from now or for the rest of their life? And I think that's really where I see the excitement. I think I, I see the excitement in that we can, we can affect and hopefully manage a disease at the, at the onset and prevent a disability six months or a year later. And I, I think that's really what, what really entices me about this disease. And we have the techniques, we have the technology, the technology we've been using for years, and now we have new, new, new technology to aspirate and what have you. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, and, you and you said it well, I mean, it is uh, a, a huge challenge for physicians, especially even in ER, uh, to actually understand, wow, this patient is actually having a pulmonary emboli, let's, uh, let's run and, uh, and run through the criteria to see if it meets a uh, specific kind of treatment in order for us to expedite. What is the actual time that it takes us at uh, our emergency rooms from the moment we identify either CT or clinical evidence uh, to the time in which you get contacted for you to intervene? So a lot of times we have, you know, we have this team, we call that PERT team that gets activated. And I would say because most patients come in not in that massive category, a lot of patients come in that submassive category. Those patients will get called. Those patients will be on anticoagulation and we'll then get blood work and we will assess 
whether that patient falls into, hey, that patient needs to be treated. And you know what we found is, unless you're in that massive category, we need to treat you right away. A lot of these patients, we have a good six, 12, 24 hours to undergo treatment once we differentiate and decide, okay, this is the right thing for that patient. Mm -hmm. Because it's really during that subacute phase is where we want to treat those submassive patients. So again, we get contacted right away. We're part of the decision-making process. And again, using all the specialties to kind of make that decision. Mm -hmm. And an interdisciplinary approach always helps. Um, Dr. Kusterman has another question. Is a patient with recurrent BPH post-TERP a good candidate for prostatic embolization? Yeah, I mean, these are special types of patients because they've already had a TERP. However, what we see is that these patients can respond to um, and have good responses to uh, embolization, particularly if they have a good TERP. Because I think that means that there's still all the peripheral and all the other aspects of the prostate gland may be accessible. Great. Um, oh, it, it's the same question. So yeah, Dr. Pena, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously an exciting, exciting moment for um, our entire team at Baptist, just simply because of the advent of the new technologies and the new protocols that we have been implementing. And uh, things such as uh, the stroke um, teams and uh, the rapid response and, and all this incredible uh, commitment to prompt response and care is what has made us uh, what we are now at, um, at MCDI. So kudos to you and to your team. Um, we're going to give a few more seconds uh, for any other questions. Maybe Dr. Kusterman and, and, uh, and his colleagues could uh, bring up some new ones. Uh, is there anything else that you would recommend to our partners abroad that have not initiated these types of like in the parks criteria uh, at the hospital in order for them to at least identify those patients promptly? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I think that that's really one of the take home messages being able to identify a patient, being able to see, um, you know, basically when a patient is there. A lot of times you can get that information from the CT scan, get a measurement from the CT scan. Is there, is there enlargement of the right ventricle? Um, obviously looking at the patient, looking at some of the blood work, getting a troponin, you know, these are common labs that we, you know, you can pretty much have in many places. And then being able to assess and say, wow, this patient, may, you know, we need to be a little bit more careful with this patient. Maybe we need to be more aggressive in the management of that patient. So I think this is something that uh, should, should be spread around the board. And I, I think this is, this will affect you know everyone. It's not just MCBI. I think everyone will be affected with this type of treatment. Absolutely. Um, another question from Dr. Kusterman. It's uh, for pulmonary embolize, uh, embolize, embolism uh, treatment. When would you use the Angiovac device over other devices? So the Angiovac device is a device that's a. Uh, it's like when I talked about a vacuum cleaner. The angio device, angio is probably the first kind of aspiration catheters that we have. And the ones that I'm talking about are about eight French or six French. It gives you an idea about the size of a pencil. Some of them may be the size of a pen. The angio device is about a 24 French device. So it's a very big device. It's the first device that we had. And our experience with that has been really to clean out the IVC. Um, it requires a you know, bypass machine. So basically, you have to put the patients on some kind of hemo to hemo uh, uh, bypass to be able to filter as you're taking out the clot. So I, I think that Androvac was a device that we used at the very beginning. I think it's still very good when you have a significant amount of clot. I would expect that as our devices with the newer devices, these newer smart devices come about, we may be able to avoid having to use those. And I, I think the jury is still out. Great. Well, Dr. Uh, Pena, what a great conference and what incredible, two difficult topics. And uh, thank you to everyone for uh, those questions. Um, and uh, we have unfortunately come to uh, the end of the conference, the lecture rather. And uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Pena, once again for your informative presentation and to all of you for participating and attending this uh, lecture. If you have additional questions about Dr. Tino Peñez's uh, presentation, please feel free to email it to us at internationalaboutthishealth.net. We'll make sure to get it to him 
in order for you to get a response immediately. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next cardiac and vascular lecture series scheduled for February 3rd, 2021. Thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon and please stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Pena. Thank you.